What's up guys, Justin here with the SketchupEssentials.com. So in today's video, we're going to check out the features contained inside the newest version of Twinmotion, version 2024.1. Let's go ahead and just jump into it. Alright, so first off, you can download the newest version of Twinmotion inside of the Epic Games Launcher by going into the Twinmotion tab. Within the Twin Motion tab, you want to download 2024.1 Preview. Note this is a preview version, meaning there are some features that are still um, in development. You might see a little bit of stability issues in there, um, just depending on which tools that you're using. And so you can see detailed documentation on all of the new features by visiting the 2024.1 Preview Release Notes page, which I will link to in the notes down below. And so one thing to note, is if you visit the home page, so when you first open up Twin Motion, um, especially if you have the show on startup box checked over here, um, you can go into your templates and note that there's a new example file in here. It's the Iceland environmental shop. And so this is a great place to try some of the new tools contained inside of this new version of Twin Motion. All right, so first off, there are two tools that I am super excited about that can now be found under the populate menu. So up to this point, we've already had placement options, but there's a new feature you're going to find in here. There's actually two, um, but one of them is the area feature. What the area feature is going to do is it's going to allow you to take objects. So let's say that we wanted to add some rocks, for example. So we're just going to drag a couple rocks in here from the library like this. And you could also do this with trees and vegetation, but notice how you get this dot inside of the scene. Well, notice that if I click in here, I can add an area. And so by defining an area, you can actually set where objects are going to be placed in this space like this. And so this is running a little bit slow because I've got it running on my laptop. But notice how I can click in here to close this in order to create space that these objects are going to be placed in. And so notice how right now this only dropped one rock in, but you can scroll down into the scatter settings right here and you can adjust this. So notice how if I bring the spacing down, I'm going to be able to place more objects in this space right here. And notice how we can adjust the randomization of the spacing right here, as well as the probability of objects being placed in that space. So notice how if I bring that up, for example, it's going to be more likely to place additional objects in this space. And so this can be especially helpful for defining areas where you want to place things like trees. So say I place a longer box in here like this. I guess it's not technically a box, but that's okay. So if we go into our library, and vegetation, and drag some trees in here, and notice how you can kind of see a preview in here before you put your trees in. So for example, say that I was to bring my spacing up, meaning there's going to be more spacing between my objects. I'm going to have less objects in here. But now if I was to drag one of these trees in my box right here, notice how those are going to get placed inside of this box. So um, you do want to be a little bit careful with the trees and objects that you place in here. But one cool thing about this is you can just right click and you can delete them in order to get rid of them. So in this case, we'd probably want a much smaller tree. So maybe like a vine, maple or something like that. And I didn't really make this a giant area, but you can see how you can use this in order to really quickly place objects in areas that you define, which is a great new feature. And so in addition, in the populate tab, under place, there's a tool in here for spacing. And so if you select spacing, what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to place an object based on an individual path like this. So say that I was to place a path along this road like this, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to drop maybe a street light in here like this. Notice how this is going to place street lamps in here. And so one cool thing about this is notice how you've got the option here for a random lateral offset. What that's going to do is that's going to randomly offset those objects based on a distance from your singular point. You can also adjust the count, which is going to adjust the number of objects that are in here. So obviously with street lights, this isn't necessarily ideal, but if you're doing things like trees and other vegetation, being able to create a line and then offset things off of that line is super valuable. Now note that you can put multiple objects in here. So let's say for example that we were to take something other than street lights. So I'm going to take this light and delete it. And instead, we're going to put some trees in here. So if I drag 
Again, I think I want some kind of smaller trees like this. But notice how you can use this option down here to set if these objects get placed in a random order like this. And notice how if you want to adjust that, you can go up to the random seed and click on the button right here and it's going to adjust that. But you can basically use this to place random objects from a group of objects that you select along a path. And then you can single click on these points and drag them. And notice how when you do that, that's going to change the path that this places these along. So super powerful tool for placing objects in twin motion. And so in addition, we now have the ability to apply layer IDs to different objects. So for example, say I was to select all of these snowy peaks. So I'm just going to do a shift click and select them all. I'm going to click on enable, but what I can do is I can place those on a layer so that they're exported separately um, as a part of your image export. And so what that means is that means that you can edit that more inside of another program. And so say that we were to select one image in here and we were to go into our settings, right? So I've selected this one image right here. Notice how there's an option to export the different render layers, so you can click on them to select them. And then, if we scroll down, we're going to click on the option to start export. And so when you do this, notice how what this does is this exports two masks, right? There's one mask that allows you to select the sky, and there's another mask that has uh, the mountains that were selected as a layer in there as well. And you can bring those into Photoshop and you can use those in order to select layers really easily in order to make post-processing adjustments. So that's actually a pretty exciting new feature because it really allows you a lot more control over um, the ability to post-process your objects. And so another really exciting addition is they've added a slot in your materials for ambient occlusion. So notice how I've got this tile material in here right here and it looks fine, but sometimes uh, you wanna highlight some of the crevices and like darker areas of an object. Well, a lot of textures come with maps that you can apply in here. So this one, for example, I think I downloaded from Texture Haven, but it's got an ambient occlusion map. And notice how when I bring that map in and I adjust the intensity, I get a lot more highlights in here um, especially of things like the grout lines and things like that. So notice how you can use this in order to add much more realistic um, kind of cavity maps and details on objects. So notice how you can really increase the um, you you can really increase the uh, amount of contrast that you have in an object by using these new ambient occlusion texture slots. Um, one thing to be aware of with this though is this is currently not enabled in the path trace mode. So if I jump over into the path tracer, like this, notice how that ambient occlusion doesn't really show up. So this is currently not enabled in path trace mode. You're gonna to wanna to use it either with standard mode or lumen rendering mode. So in the ambiance settings, they've added a new section under camera for bloom and flares. And so basically what this has done is this has put all of the lens flare and bloom options in the same section. And notice how there's a little bit of a library in here for being able to adjust these, but notice how you can click and drag and add bloom around your sun, and you can adjust the kind of bloom that's in here, as well as having the ability to adjust the lens flare. So notice how you can adjust the amount of flare that's happening in your scene like this. And there is also an option in here to add dirt to your lens. Um, I'm not seeing a ton of changes on this one, but honestly, that's one I haven't really played around with that much. But if you do want to add some lens flare to your scene or some bloom, you can find those in your camera settings. And so they've also updated the fabric workflow. So um, now there's two options. There's options for standard and thin. And you can find those over here on the right hand side under your material. You can select between standard and thin material. Um, but basically what that's going to do is your standard is going to be exactly what it sounds like. It's going to be your typical fabric material where the thin is going to be for things that are see-through. So if you want to create like drapes or other things like that, you can use that thin setting. And so when you create new materials, if you click on this little drop down right here, notice how you can create these materials as different kinds of objects. Well, in this case, we're going to create a foliage material. And so let's say that we take that and we apply it to the surface right here. Notice how all that's going to do is that's going to apply this in here and it's got kind of a transparency mask to it like this, but it's basically a new 
foliage material and what it does is it allows you to either use your global seasons or force a season so what that means is that means that, that material is going to adjust in here based on what season it is so notice how if you set this to like winter for example this foliage is going to um, not be here at all so basically if you applied that to a tree or something like that in the winter time it wouldn't show up and so you've got options in here to set um, the different season colors so for example Notice how each one of these has a different kind of spectrum of colors in here um, that's going to make this look different depending on what the season is. You can also adjust the leaves life cycle. This is actually really interesting because basically this is just a transparency mask that adjusts based on the season that you have in here, right? So notice how this one, for example, the leaves would hide for most of the seasons in here. And so that mask is kind of tied to this right here. So notice how those leaves for the majority of the seasons are transparent right here. So this is actually a really interesting way to do this. And I don't know if other programs are doing this in the background or what, but you can set you know, how long into a season objects show up using these masks right here. So if you are looking to kind of like customize some of your foliage in here, this is definitely an interesting way to do that. And so we've also got some changes to our animations. So for example, we've got um, the film back option, which has been added in your camera settings, right? So I'm in my media settings right here in the animations, but notice how if you click on the ambiance and click on the camera and scroll down, there's an option for film back. And so when you do a film back, what that's gonna do is that's gonna allow you to select different presets in here and match your camera to actual real world cameras, right? So I can come in here and say that you wanted this to be a super 16 millimeter. You can select that and notice how that's adjusting the way that your camera works and brings in light. So you can use this in order to match real world cameras. Um, now I'm, I'm not going to lie for what, for what I do. I've never really needed to match a real world camera, but I know a lot of people in like film and other industries do use twin motion. So this could be definitely be a cool way to uh, visualize different shots and things like that. And so they've actually made a few different changes to the camera settings. So, um, and we're not going to focus on all of these, but specifically I want to focus on the sequence media type. So basically what they've done is they've given us the ability now if we click, instead of clicking on this button right here, um, in order to create like a single clip, if you click on this option for sequences right here, what that's going to do is that's going to allow you to create these in more like chronological order. So say, for example, that I wanted to create a sequence right here. Notice how I can click in order to create a scene, and then I can move the camera forward, and I can create a different location like this. So it's much more linear. It's much more, uh, it's much more easy to follow. Um, so notice how I can play this. And this is going to kind of uh, stitch those together um, with your additional scenes. So you can use this in order to create more like longer sequences and things like that. One other thing to note is note that it's now possible to combine animators. So um, rotators and translators in your scene graph. So what that means is that means that you can now make objects that both rotate and move in your scenes, allowing you to create more complex animations. All right, so that's where I'm in this video. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think about this new version of Twin Motion. I'm especially excited about those placement features. I think they're going to be super valuable, but I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. If you do want to learn more about how to use Twin Motion, you can check out my Twin Motion Essentials course. I will link to that in the notes down below as well. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks, guys.